So I'm here to present to you some work that was actually completed last year. And it was completed together with a student group that I work with in a course that I teach within the Human Connects Diploma Program. So I have prepared a talk with some PowerPoint slides entitled Healthy Eating and Food Security. But it's really not my work. It's the work of 24 undergraduate students in the second year of our Human Connects Diploma Program that are busy trying to learn how to help to influence the health of many people as one person acting towards many. So just, just give you a little bit more background. So the Human Connect Diploma Program is a two-year program here at the college. Most of the students that are interested in human kinetics are active types. They like exercising. Some of them think that exercise is medicine. And so they come in wanting to think about how they can use physical activity as a way to improve the health of individuals and groups of people. Many go on to the health field or the education field, and so interested really about trying to make a difference in the world around them in a variety of different ways. What you'll notice is that um, the topic today is food security. And so here I am as a physical education professional or a physical activity professional, yet talking to you about food security. And that's because our field has broadened to include more healthy lifestyle activities that are not just related to physical activity, but there's a lot of other activities that we know that people can engage in to try to lead a healthier lifestyle. And eating and nutrition is one of those things. The course that I teach is called Health Policy and Society. It's a university transfer course, and it transfers to a bunch of different degree programs all across the province. And it focuses on introducing students to what are called the social determinants of health. And those are things like poverty. Poverty makes a big impact on your overall health. If you get an education, that makes a big difference in your overall health throughout the year. There's actually 11 different social determinants of health. And so this course really broadens people's perspectives on the things that make us healthy. It tries to de-emphasize or maybe put into perspective our personal lifestyle choices and make us understand that it's not just the choices that we make that lead to a healthier life, it's also the society that we create for ourselves that, and the environment that we are, well, that we choose to live in that makes a difference for our overall health. It also helps us to understand that health problems are complex and multifaceted. Often we think they're simple, you know, just eat right, eat your vegetables, for example, and you'll be healthy. Right? It's maybe not so easy for Okanagan College students to eat their vegetables. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as I go through the presentation. It also helps to consider that personal and social responsibility. So we often have debates about whose responsibility is it? Is it your own personal responsibility or is it the responsibility of society? And really we emphasize that it's going to take in what's called intersectoral action to come up with some real solutions that are going to make a difference for everyone. And that means that we have to stop working in our various departments right, and start working together to make a healthier community for everybody. So at the end of the day, I want to introduce students to the many jobs that are out there where one professional, instead of working one-on-one -on -one as a physician might with a patient or as a personal trainer might with a fitness client, there are lots of jobs out there where somebody is working in a capacity where they're trying to influence the health of many people. I just had Carol Sheridan in from the town of Oliver, who's the recreation manager down there. And she talked about how hard it was for her to have a desk job, right? She's working at a desk now as a physical activity leader. But that desk job is allowing her to do things to influence decision makers and try to get resources to be able to improve some parkland, for example, so that it can improve the opportunities that youth have in the local community to engage in physical activity in their local parks. So these are some examples of local people that are working as one single professional that are working in the capacity of developing the health of many people at the same time. So for our assignment, I tried to get a bit creative and I said, well, let's introduce students to this as a group research project. So it's a group project assignment in the winter of 2016 is what I'm going to present to you today. We had 12 weeks and I had 24 undergraduate students to be able to engage them in something that we call authentic assessment, where students do a real project. So it's live, we're learning as we go. Um, quite honestly, I'm learning together with the students. This isn't an area of my expertise. And I think it's important for students to have those opportunities to go into areas where, of the unknown, right? We don't know anything about this. Let's learn about this together, see what we can come up with. And in particular, let's try to gather some evidence to help to inform our perspectives so that we don't come to the table with a biased perspective. And then think about how we can make a difference in the world around us. 
So the project, I've been teaching this course now for seven years, and the topics have always been different, but the assignment components are always the same. So we do a brief literature review, we design a research proposal and seek approval and ethics considerations in order to proceed with research on human subjects. We collect some real data from human subjects as well as from the local environment or some other places where we can dig up some information. We crunch that data through data analysis and interpretation and then we get to the point of recommendations for action. So we're busy the whole semester, 12 weeks, we gotta fit it in and we pretty much get to the point where we have recommendations for action and then sadly my students disappear because they go on to university and so it leaves me here to try to um, continue with the message to various people so that we can try to create some sustainable change for the college campus. But just to give you a little bit of history on the options for topics and things we've done in the past, um, I gave this list to students. The food security <laughs> title wasn't highlighted. And so if in previous years, we've looked at things like drinking water, physical activity, and transportation as a com campus community health project. We also uh, have worked in partnership with the school district to look at some of uh, what the local elementary schools are doing with respect to healthy schools initiatives. We've also looked at um, a healthy community analysis with the Okanagan Smilk Mean Healthy Living Coalition. We partnered with that group and did an environmental scan for that group. And so we've done some community partnerships. We've done some on-campus healthy community projects. And so I pitched the idea for food security or gave them the opportunity for other things to do or repeating something we'd done in the past. And it was actually my students that chose food security as their topic of interest. And I can tell you that I had pitched that idea in previous years and the students didn't go for it. So this was their interest, it seemed to be topical. And um, also quite interesting, Donna Lomas told me that of course last year, there was a number of things that were happening in our local community around the topic of food security. And some of you may have come to some previous presentations that have been addressing this particular issue. So it seems to be of interest to my students as well as to some local community um, people and partners. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter to me what our topic is because the topic changes. What's really important is that my students understand how to analyze a complex problem and then make recommendations for action based on evidence that we've collected or been able to gather. So the culmination of last year's work is what I'm here to present to you today. And it ended up, it, um, well, it's still sitting in draft form um, in terms of it being a report. We collected a lot of data. It was difficult to distill that down into something useful. And so for now, it's been a couple presentations as well as a short report. So a short report with appendices, really summarizing some of the key indicators and where it can go from there. So this is a student-driven analysis with some recommendations for improving the campus community health. I guess I wanna pause just for a moment as well here to recognize that, um, oh, self-disclosure. Right? I've never been food insecure. So it was really interesting for me, what I mean by that is I've always had enough food. I've never had to make the choice of not eating my fruits and vegetables because I didn't have enough money to be able to have fruits and vegetables. Um, when I think of my post-secondary experience, my post-secondary experience was one where I could still buy a meal plan. That was an all-you-can-eat meal plan. So in my first year of university, I lived in residence and I had an all-you-can-eat meal plan. And so I had access to food whenever I wanted it. Now I will be honest with you, the quality of the, like, the chicken parmigiana and the chicken florentina and the chicken, you know, the recycled chicken patty that just had different toppings every week or every day wasn't the best, but um, certainly I never went hungry. And so this was a topic when we started thinking, you know, there's the healthy eating side, which I was very familiar with, but it's the food security side that I really had to sort of start thinking about and start thinking about it differently. Um, I started talking to, to some friends and family and I started to realize that um, a number of people as they go through university or college experiences do so with the help of a food bank, for example. Now I never knew that about these people that I started talking to, but they said, oh yeah, Wendy, I've gone to pick up a couple baskets at the food bank when I was a student. That's the only way I could get through school. I'm like, really, did you ever tell anybody? And they said, well, no, I didn't tell anybody. It was just what I had to do to survive. Um, on the other side of it, um, Another person that's very close to me played on the basketball team. You know, so as a student athlete, uh, he decided to buy the lunch meal plan. That was the, the cheapest meal plan available. And it was a four hour window of all you can eat. So he could go in at 10 
And as long as if he stayed into the food service area, he could have another meal at two. And those would be his two meals of the day. And then he'd live on craft dinner and tomato soup for the rest of the week. So I started to go, wow, OK, these are people that I know and that I, I know quite well. And I never knew that this was their experience as they went through their post-secondary study. So this is me just trying to go, OK, I have to approach this project with a very open mind. Because certainly the students' experiences that, uh, of students that are food insecure are not the same as the experiences that I had. So I had to make sure that I was approaching this to say, OK, this isn't my experience. This is about learning more about the experiences of others, and in particular, discovering some secrets. Because a lot of people don't share this information um, with you on a regular basis. So we set out with a typical scientific purpose. I'm a social scientist, essentially, to say that we need to understand the complex set of issues surrounding healthy eating and food security at the college campus within the college population with the goal of making recommendations to improve health and sustainability at the Penticton campus community. So part of my job is to make it manageable for the students within that 12-week semester, really focusing on our college population and thinking about how we could make things better. Now, how many of you are familiar with the concept of food security and healthy eating? Just a show of hands if you've already been introduced to this concept. Okay, so there's a couple of people that have been introduced to the concept. It was really necessary for us to start with some ideas around, well, what is food security if we're going to study it? And how are we going to understand this better? So we took the definition of food security from the Dietitians of Canada. They're one of the leading professional groups in this area. And they've put a definition as food security is the access at all times to sufficient, safe, personally acceptable, nutritious foods produced in a manner that promotes health, protects the environment, and adds economic and social value to our communities. This is a very comprehensive definition. And one of the most comprehensive definitions, in particular the second half of the definition, is more comprehensive than a lot of uh, the research on food security out there. We also thought, well, what could a college do about food security? And so we took a look at some leading post-secondary institutions. And one of my favorites is the University of California, it, particularly because the University of California set out as its institutional goal to become a global leader in food security for the globe, right? To make sure that by the time we have 8 billion people in 2025, that the Earth is, is able to produce enough food to feed all of those people. And so, but they said, okay, we're gonna do that. So we'll set up this institute and we'll put a lot of money into research into this area and we'll try to be a leader globally in this, in this area. They also had the wherewithal to go, you know what? We can't be a leader globally in this field if we don't also look inside our institution and recognize that many of the students that come to our institution to study these things are also dealing with food insecurity. And so at the same time that they set out externally to become a leader in global food insecurity, they also set out to become a leader in post-secondary food security for their student population. So we stole a few quotes from their website. Eating unhealthy food and skipping meals should not be a rite of passage for college students. And we believe that for our students to thrive, they must be food secure. For anybody that's uh, learned about food security, we're now looking at food security as a holistic cycle. And so if we start up there at food production, what you can see is that um, we're lucky we have lots of food production in our local area. But then it comes to processing our food, how that food gets distributed, how individuals can access that food at various markets or food outlets, how people are making choices around food consumption. And then also we're now looking at resource and waste recovery. And so we're doing some remarkable things actually in uh, the province of British Columbia actually at that waste recovery piece now. About how, and then the transportation piece. So there, you know, people that are interested in this area sort of pick a piece of what's happening here and think about how they can make improvements in those areas. Now our study, we had to limit it. We looked a little bit at, at food production in the local area, but mostly focused on access and consumption of foods for individuals here on campus. Now this is a lot of information for one slide. It is borrowed from the Hamilton Community Food Security Stakeholders Committee. We do have some food security stakeholder committees that are active. Well, there's now one I just became aware of in the town of Oliver. They're actively working on food security in the town of Oliver. 
I know that the North Okanagan also has a food security group that's working. And so there are various community uh, partnerships that have come together to work on uh, food security continuum is usually the approach that they take. So many of you are probably familiar with the short-term relief that is necessary in our local area. And those are things like food banks and uh, community, guard, uh, community kitchens. Sorry, food banks and emergency food supplies. Sorry, I got that all messed up. And so that's basically short-term relief for, for somebody that's hungry. So I'm hungry, I've gotten myself into a situation, I can't afford to buy food, where can I go to get some? And so that's the short-term relief part that many communities have. We're trying to move away from short-term relief to building capacity and empowering individuals in the community. Um, we have some amazing things happening at the Penticton Indian Band here locally in terms of developing a community garden as well as a community kitchen together with their school and health facility. So if ever you want to go for a visit somewhere, I would highly recommend going to um, their health center and seeing what they're doing there in terms of developing capacity and empowering individuals in the community to grow and then prepare and then consume their own food in a continuum kind of way. Uh, stage three, we're also trying to shift people away from that and thinking also about systemically. So how are we making decisions on um, our land allocation, for example? These are really big things that communities decide upon. Making sure that we maintain our agricultural space, for example, so that we can continue to grow food for the populations that live here. And then there's a few other uh, things there. We focused mostly on the short-term relief and stage two, building capacity and empowering individuals within our study. So the results that I have to present to you are in two parts. The first part is related to um, food insecurity and healthy eating for our student population here at Okanagan College. And then the second part looks at the uh, external environment. That's access to food um, and different food outlets around the college here on campus. So you recall that we did a brief literature review. I've put the two pieces together so that you can develop some awareness about the state of food insecurity in Canada first, and then I'll go into the data for the student uh, study that we did. So despite Canada's economic wealth, more than one in 10 households and one in six children are food insecure. Inadequate household income is the strongest predictor of food insecurity. So a little research has examined the experience of people living with food insecurity. What we know is that uh, in a few studies, they've looked at the fact that it is attached to shame and social stigma. And so often it results in a state of alienation and psychological suffering for those that are um, needing to go for help. Many post-secondary students have little knowledge about food insecurity. And it was something that I never really paid attention to and was quite surprised at the number of students that I had in my own class that were food insecure. And so I'd been teaching for 20 years and it never even occurred to me that some of the students that were sitting in my class weren't able to eat breakfast that morning, for example, or couldn't afford a healthy lunch because they didn't have enough money to be able to buy fruits and vegetables. What's interesting about the, and so part of the assumption is that with post-secondary study, students have to pay tuition, they have to buy books, they have to be able to support themselves in their independence as they're becoming emerging adults. I've learned that new term this year, at this emerging adult stage of development. And, um, and so they have to sort that out, right? And, but what we notice now is that many, because tuition's been increasing, cost of books has been increasing significantly, they become food insecure once they're um, on campus due to lack of financial resources and lack of earning potential to be able to get a job to be able to support um, their basic needs. So the data that we gathered was a student survey. It was pen and paper survey. We did hallway recruitment. And um, we did survey the whole campus population, which includes students and employees. But none of our employees are food insecure, and so most of the data that I'm going to present to you is the data from 100 students that responded to our survey. That's 15% of our campus population. So that we consider that an adequate response for a population health survey. 25% is an excellent response, and so 15 is adequate to be able to make some uh, recommendations from the information that we gathered. To be able to determine whether students were food insecure, we used a six item 
USDA survey, US, that's the United States Department of Agriculture, I think, actually, um, survey module for food security. So the questions that you see on the left were the ones that were actually on the survey. And so consider your food experiences and affordability in the last 30 days. And you had an opportunity to say yes or no to each of the following items. So the first question was, the food that I bought just didn't last and I didn't have money to get more. And so 53% of our student population said yes to that question. I cannot afford to eat balanced and nutritious meals. 41% of our students said yes to that question. In the last 30 days, did you ever cut the size of your meals or skip a meal because there wasn't enough money for food? 21% said yes to that question. If you said yes to the previous question, if you did that more than three days in one week, you answered yes, well, you got an affirmative response in this box here. So 7% of our student population that answered the survey, 100 students, seven of them, um, did this one more than three times in one week. In the last 30 days, did you ever eat less than you felt you should because there wasn't enough money for food? 28% of our student population said yes to that question. And then in the last 30 days, were you ever hungry and didn't eat because there wasn't enough money for food? And that was 19% of our survey respondents said yes to that question. So from this standard survey module, we have the ability to classify students in a, a scale of food security or food insecurity. And so if a student answered yes to any one of those questions, they were deemed to, to have indications of food security, insecurity. And if they answered yes to two or more items on this scale, they're rated at low or very low food insecurity. And so here's the summary of our population for the Okanagan College campus. So there was indications of food insecurity amongst 69% of our, our student respondents. So 69 out of 100 students said yes to any one of those questions from the previous slide. When we look at low or very low food security, that means they answered two or more affirmative responses to the six items that I just showed you on the previous slide. Four in 10 students, 40% of our student population said yes to two or more of those items. What I've done in this slide is I've compared the Okanagan College students to um, the statistic that I gave you earlier for Canadian children, one in six. And the statistic that I gave you earlier, this should say Canadian households, one in 10. And so what you can see is that the college population group has a much higher prevalence of food insecurity than children in Canada or Canadian households in general. The other question we were curious about was around healthy eating, right? As of course, we have to think about not only do you have enough calories to keep you going and to keep you from getting hungry, we also want to think about, okay, let's think about it from the other side, is do you have enough nutrients to be able to keep you living healthy? And so this question is the most popular question as a one single question on a population health survey as one indicator of whether you're eating a healthy diet or not. So we use one question, it says, um, the question is, do you consume more than five servings of fruits and vegetables per day? So let's think about it. Do you consume, let's think about today, because you've all had dinner, right? Okay, so how many of you had five servings of fruits or vegetables today? Or more? Okay, so that means you have, like, you have to have it for breakfast and for snack and for dinner and for lunch and for snack and for dinner, that's five servings of fruit. Now, an apple is a serving, right? Or maybe this much lettuce is a serving. If you make a salad, you can get two servings out of it because you got your lettuce and then you got the extra stuff that you put on top. Okay, so these are ways that we can add more fruits and vegetables to our diet. They say now half of your dinner plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables. Something to think about as far as the current recommendations. It's not four squares anymore, it's actually half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables in terms of healthy eating. So the five fruits and vegetables a day is a fairly modest indicator of, of healthy eating practice. Now, what's interesting is, I don't know if you have anyone in your life that's in the school system, elementary school or high school. Do you know that we have a BC fruits and vegetables program where we are actually trying to encourage more kids in the elementary and the high school system to be able to consume fruits and vegetables by providing boxes of locally grown fruits and vegetables on a regular basis for free? And so they get that, like it's Kiwi Day, or I don't know why Kiwis come into it, it's Cucumber Day, let's use cucumbers, Cucumber Day. 
And so boxes of cucumbers come into the school and then students have access to cucumbers so that they get an opportunity to consume more fruits and vegetables in their diet. So because we have a BC program, we also are interested in how that program is working. And so the, um, the I just want to remember the right thing, the Provincial Health Services Authority keeps track, using survey data, of fruits and vegetable consumption between grades 3 and 4, grade 7, grade 10, and grade 12. And so the blue bar is the Okanagan. So what percentage of the Okanagan population in grade 3 and 4 are consuming five or more fruits and vegetables? And so you'll see that that's slightly over 50% of our grade 3 and 4 kids that are consuming more than five fruits and vegetables a day. The orange bar is the BC statistic. So you can compare if you want to take a look at the Okanagan data compared to the BC data. You'd like to think we're eating more fruits and vegetables when we live here, don't you think? Turns out that we're not, well, it depends on which grade you look at. So that's the, the school age data. This comes from a community, let me just think here, Canadian Community Health Survey which is also summarized for our, our uh, local area as well as the province by the Provincial Health Services Authority. So this data is gathered from Statistics Canada. And so when you look at our adult population, they consume around, uh, sorry, around 40 to 43% um, of, of BC adults consume more than five fruits and vegetables per day. So the red bar is our data. Why is there only one? Well, I'm not aware of any survey that collects data specifically on post-secondary students. So the only data I have to compare to is the data that we collected. And so what we found to the, this question is that um, about 37% of our college population were getting five or more fruits and vegetables per day as an indication of, of the idea that they have a healthy diet. Do you notice anything about that data? What do you notice? Well, it's less than everything else. It's the lowest bar, right? So right as we have young people who are becoming these emerging adults that are supposed to be setting some of their healthy lifestyle practices for the rest of their life, they're actually mm, not consuming as many fruits and vegetables as we'd like. Lower than our grade school population and certainly lower than our adult population. So what was the summary from this section of our report? Well, many HKIN students were surprised and concerned that the data was so uh, prevalent in terms of food insecurity amongst their peers. We talked about it being an invisible problem. And the leading work at the University of California suggests that we have to get away from this notion that the starving student is a normal rite of passage for young people in, in Canada that we need to consider perhaps the cultural shift and consider things a little bit differently. So this elaborates on that point a little bit. I've had some subsequent discussions with a few people. Um, and in particular, you know, when a young adult student enters post-secondary study from a position of privilege, you know, having to deal with some short-term hardship could benefit character development while they figure out how to manage a budget and make good decisions and buy things that are most appropriate and be able to, you know, to use trial and error to be able to fix uh, some of the things that are happening in their own personal growth and development. Um, you know, that might be okay, but we discussed also that it's different when a college student enters post-secondary study from a position of social disadvantage. And in that case, they're continuing to deal with um, challenges that, um, that they're trying to overcome by getting an education and being able to get a better job, hopefully, at the end of their education here. Um, and we also uh, recognize that many of our students are mature students. And so in some cases, they're sacrificing their own food for their children, right? Because they want to, and it turns out that um, the highest risk group are, are single mothers in Canada. Um, making sacrifices um, for a variety of reasons and not eating healthy. We also questioned why post-secondary students are considered different than students in the school system. You know, the province is making a lot of efforts to suggest that more and more of the jobs that are going to become available in the province of British Columbia are jobs that are going to require a post-secondary education. You know, so one might argue that, you know, a young person is not fully mature until they've had some college experience. 
And so maybe we do need to put some more supports in place for college age students to be able to get to that. I was lucky, my parents decided that they weren't done supporting me until I was done my first degree, right? And so they paid and, and were able to support me right up until I finished my undergraduate degree. I was also lucky because I changed my mind but was still able to finish my degree in four years. Not everybody's so lucky when you decide, you know, you try one thing, it doesn't work for you, you have to change. Uh, some of my friends took seven or eight years to finish their undergraduate degree. And then nowadays you hear a lot of kids, tell, well a lot of kids, young students telling me, well I need a master's degree to get to where I want to be. So that's six years of undergraduate study, at a ma or four years of undergrad plus two years of master's study to get to become a physiotherapist. That's a long time before you have some real earning potential. So you're, uh, you're surviving on very little means as you go through, or you're accumulating a significant amount of debt as they uh, accumulate student loans. So the second stage of our data collection was looking at um, access for uh, food by the student population. So looking at our literature, we found out that um, accessible food choices around schools and homes of vulnerable people influence the intake of nutritious foods. So there's been a lot of study, particularly in the United States, around what they call food deserts. And a lot of low-income neighborhoods don't even have a grocery store where you could get a full selection of food items. Um, I think we're a little bit better here in the local area in terms of having um, people are able to access foods. But I would say to you that, um, you know, when we look at the post-secondary sector, uh, food services is now not something that the college provides. We have space that we contract out to food distributors. Um, and that's across Canada, right? And so we're lucky here, we have a local food provider. But many food service agencies at post-secondary institutions went corporate. And so then it went to a selection of food court items that you'd have in your cafeteria space, um, which may or may not be the healthiest choices. You have a captive market, right, in terms of students on campus in particular, especially if they have limited transportation choices. Um, you know, bus, busing to be able to access various food, uh, food outlets. So that's where we looked at the location of food outlets, because the location of food outlets does make a difference in terms of what people consume. And then we also looked at local sustainable food systems. And we're very lucky in the Okanagan, BC is the birthplace of the 100 mile diet concept. Are you guys familiar with that concept? So the 100 mile, it's a book, if you want to grab the book, it's an interesting read. And it's the notion that consumers should, in an ideally food secure world, be able to obtain most of their dietary requirements year round from sources within 100 mile radius of their home. So think about that when you go to purchase your items at the food store. So I sent 24 students off to gather information about the local food production, off-campus food environment, on-campus food environment, emergency short-term relief programs that are accessible to students, and then a little bit about capacity building via community gardens and community kitchens. So we're lucky students noticed that we did have a lot of food production in our local area. So if, choose, if students chose to buy local, they could. We also have a lot of promotion programs that are featuring local produce, especially when our apple growers try to compete with the Washington apples and things don't really come out, even for, uh, for our growers. Um, it does make uh, it important that people make choices when they buy produce to support local growers. And so here's a combination of information from uh, students create an interactive map highlighting food production in the local area. And uh, survey respondents revealed that 63% make an effort to purchase locally produced foods. So the young people on our campus are really keen to continue to, to purchase locally produced foods. Only 16%, do you guys know what a gleaning program is? We have some nods. So a gleaning program is when a local grower doesn't have the ability to, um, to pick all of their produce and then get it to market. And it would go, normally go to waste. And so a gleaning program is where a group of volunteers go in and actually help to pick the produce. And then usually, so that's the manpower for free to get the, the food off of the growing lands. And then oftentimes it's done under a sharing circumstance. So half of the produce you could keep for yourself and half of it would go to a food bank or a soup kitchen, for example. So it's a really neat um, thing that uh, people have set up. There are some 
uh, gleaning programs available through the Okanagan Fruit Tree Project. And so 16% of our student population didn't know what that was. And we thought, well, that might be a good idea to be able to get more students volunteering to be able to do a community event of that nature. 66% indicated that they would likely to participate one if we were able to pull one together. One of the challenges is around the timing of things, right? Harvest is September. We're just getting going. People are getting, getting themselves organized here on campus. And so it, uh, we weren't able to organize one for last fall, but we'll try again and see if we can organize one for next fall. Here's our map. Have you guys ever used Google Maps? Have you built one for yourself? These are kind of cool. So you can actually, so students took a Google Map uh, program, and the green flag is Okanagan College campus. That's where you guys are sitting right now. Can you see the Channel Parkway here? That's the Channel Parkway. There's Duncan Avenue. Okay, and here's Main Street. Are you guys recognizing your neighborhood? Okay. The red flags are all the food outlets that are off campus. So do you notice anything? Yeah, so all of our food outlets are concentrated along Main Street, right, or Martin if you get downtown, or in the area that's, that's north of the highway as you come into town. Okay. So it's a fair trek from campus. There's nothing right across the street for students to easily access between classes and then come back onto campus. So there actually is a little bit like the closest is the cannery, which is here. Okay, anything else is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit further to get there for our students and they would need more time to be able to access food off campus. Okay. So there are 22 food outlets. Do you know what their favorite ones were? We asked them. They told us Safeway was one of their favorite places to go, as well as Tim Hortons and Subway. So those were the most popular food places for students to be able to access food. Only 37% of survey respondents think that good food is available close to campus. And then 49% consider it affordable, 49%, and 30% consider it nutritious. Okay. Our on-campus food environment came out a little bit more favorably, which I think is really cool. So Mika Smith operates College Grounds. Has anyone eaten there? It's a wonderful place to come. I highly recommend it. You're welcome to come on campus and have coffee with friends or have lunch at a co a college grounds. Did I say common grounds or college grounds? I, I, can't, I always mix it up. Okay, College grounds. It's, a, it's just across in the Center for Excellence building. So on campus food environment, we have college grounds and then several vending machines on campus. That's basically all students have access to on campus. 80% of survey respondents think that good food is available on campus, which is awesome. 52% consider it affordable, and 73% consider it nutritious. And only 25% of survey respondents actually consume food from on-campus food services. Mika was interviewed as part of this project, and she's wonderful. She makes uh, decisions on a daily basis around uh, food substitutions and where she sources her local food or her food, whether she can do it locally or can't do it locally, and really tries to match the nutritious quality of the food with the affordability. Because, well, I haven't really gotten into it, but fruits and vegetables are more expensive than everything else, right? And so you have to balance the calories with the nutritional content and try to make it both affordable and nutritious. She's already made improvements. One of the suggestions from the survey was around more accessibility to specialty diets, like uh, vegetarian and gluten-free options. Particularly, the survey suggested that those items were available but ran out by the afternoon. And so she's now producing more of those items and they're selling like hotcakes. Recognizing that only 25% of survey respondents regularly buy food on campus, what do you think everybody else is doing? Well, there are a number that aren't eating, right? But how would you make it more? Well, you might be going off campus to Tim Hortons or Subway or Safeway. What else could you do? Yeah, brown bag it, right? Make your own, bring it onto campus, and then um, eat it while you're here. I really wish this was a picture of our campus. It's not. Do you know where I snapped that photo? It is, the red dot indicates that it is at Okanagan College somewhere. Does anybody know? I have a few colleagues where I snapped that photo just last week. I snapped that photo in the new trades building that they built in Kelowna. 
for the trades group up there. They actually have created three little kitchenettes that I saw. There might have been more as I wandered through the new building. And so the little kitchenette is for anyone to use to be able to heat up a lunch, uh, fill, a, fill up a, a cup to be able to warm up water for tea or make some instant coffee. And so they have, and so these are uh, sort of set up across from a bunch of, um, of food tables. And so um, the majority of survey respondents regularly bring food from home to eat on campus, that's 62%. And so they suggested that we could make some improvements here with respect to access to food preparation spaces. Um, I'll be honest, in terms of the, um, the Center of Excellence building, the focus was on energy conservation. And one of the concerns was that microwaves would, you know, if we put microwaves everywhere, that would use up too much energy. So in the decisions around, you know, energy conservation and green building, right, uh, reduced potentially some of the opportunities for making sure that students had access to um, affordable and nutritious foods. So we're working on it. Well, I'm working on it. I have to advocate for it. Yeah. There is a microwave over there now, isn't there? There's two. There's two microwaves. Well, there might only be one. Again, and, and actually our food service operator sort of, sort of looks after them, yeah. which doesn't really make sense because she's not making any money off of them. Um, but yes, they're in the cafeteria area and they are available for students to use. Yeah. Yeah. But that's compared to six. And, on this other campus facility. So, you know, something that I think we could work on a little bit more. Students looked at emergency and short-term food relief that are available to students. Uh, we have four off-campus community food banks operating, one in Summerland, two here in Penticton, and then we have the Supateria. And so there certainly are some local community groups that are working actively in this area to try to make sure that our local citizens, including our students, have access to um, uh, help from a food bank. But you'll notice that survey respondents also indicated, we asked them where they would go if they were hungry. And uh, it's good to see that 62% felt that they could rely on a personal support network. You know, going to an aunt or an uncle's house for dinner or going back home, you know, they might have to drive to Vernon to go back home for a home-cooked meal. But they might go to a personal support uh, that they have to be able to get food if they were hungry. Uh, but 22% said they'd go to the food bank and 13% said that they would go to the soup kitchen. Now that's not that they are going there, that's if they would go there if they're hungry. So we didn't ask specifically if anybody was accessing the food bank or the superteria to support their dietary needs. We also found out, interestingly enough, that we had a bunch of um, food short-term relief here on campus. It wasn't highly advertised, but you know what, if you walk into the library, they had a basket of granola bars. If you went over to the Aboriginal lounge, they also had a basket of food there all the time. Wasn't highly advertised, but people sort of found out about it and knew that it was there, and if they wanted it, no questions asked, you could grab something to sort of keep you going. We also have a food bookshelf in our women's center. Again, something that was, I would call it underdeveloped, and so we have a women's center on the second floor at the Center of Excellence. And the women's center there, it's just some sort of an office. You do have to walk into the office and pass somebody to sort of get to the food shelf. And again, it's not highly advertised. And actually, subsequent to this study, they were looking at making it more formal. It was kind of informal in terms of providing assistance to those in need on campus. We also do the um, run a Christmas hamper program here for, for students in need. And so that's run by the college staff and faculty and students through a donation program to be able to offer uh, food, uh, food and um, uh, presents, like uh, items for families in need. John, do you remember how many we gave out this year? Sorry to put you on the spot. I think it was like 22 food hampers, Christmas hampers. Yeah, there's a, okay. Yeah, I don't know, it's up there. Like I'm always surprised by how many um, uh, generous uh, donations people make on campus for students uh, in need on campus. And so that um, really just highlighted some of the great work that people were already doing in this area on campus, but it really was, again, something that was not highly advertised. It was something that we were doing because we knew it was a good thing to do, but really weren't promoting it, so not all students knew about it. And then lastly, the college, I don't know, this campus is known for their food events. Um, and so both the college and the Okanagan College Student Union 
um, run several campus-wide food events. Almost every month we have something. I always know about it because my students are right on top of the free food. So they come in with the Aboriginal tacos and then they come in with the wraps. You know, we do It's a Wrap at the end of the semester. And so um, we also do a, a turkey dinner, you know, and I'm always amazed, you know, um, I, a really heartfelt story from Donna Lomas, one of our deans, who was thanked wholeheartedly by a mature student who said that was the first turkey dinner they'd ever had. And so I was like, wow, that's amazing um, to be able to provide full spread, you know, like stuffing and mashed potatoes and cranberry and just the whole, the whole works for students here on campus. And then lastly, we looked at uh, capacity building via community gardens and kitchens. And so students identified several local groups developing capacity via community gardens and community kitchens. So the Penticton Indian Band I already mentioned already, they have done an uh, amazing development um, uh, right around their wellness uh, center. So it's interesting, right? Because we, I mean, we certainly are developing our culinary culture in the Okanagan and working on it at that level, but then that's a whole different level, right? Where we're pairing wine with food and all that kind of stuff. Um, looking at, you know, how are we making, are we also making sure that we're using those spaces for some social action to be able to make sure that um, everyone in our community is looked after in that way. I wanted to include the um, Okanagan College in the Vernon campus. I don't know if any of you have traveled up to Vernon to uh, tour the campus up there. Um, they've able, they were able to create a community partnership with a group in the local community, and they now have something called Patchwork Farms. And so it's on college property, but it's run by a community group. And they actually, I think they're at the point where they're doing market food production. And so the food that they produce at the community garden in Vernon is going out to market and, and being able to be sold in some cases. In other cases, it's just grown for uh, personal consumption. One specific case that I wanted to highlight for you, um, it was actually two of the students in my class came to me and they said, oh, that, you know, I'm really interested in being able to grow my own food. This is a really cheap way to be able to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. But they didn't have any access to land. And they called a few community gardens, and the, those community gardens were all full. And so I was like, oh, you know, and so here's a young person that's motivated, who's keen to learn, who has made the effort to find some seeds, and they just don't have the land. Um, and it just so happened that I was um, looking at something that was happening in Kelowna, and I said, well, hey, I just noticed there's two plots available at the college community garden in Kelowna. Why don't you give this number a call? And they did, and they came to class the next day, and they said, hey, we got two plots. And I thought, wow, how awesome is that? But it really made me realize that you know, some of the problems that we're having is really just about the lack of a social network. You know, We have people that have land. They're not connected to young people that have energy and an interest in maybe growing something on that land. And so in some cases, what's really needed is just you know, connecting those two people so that somebody could use that land to grow something that would be helpful to improve the nutrition and food security of uh, some of these young people. So it's a success story. Uh, it helped me realize that sometimes all we need to do is build, build those bridges between groups. So many HKIN students felt fortunate to be living in the Okanagan where locally grown uh, nutritious food is available, but they realized that it wasn't equally accessible by all individuals in the Okanagan. And in some cases, healthy, affordable food options could be improved with proposed recommendations. So that's where we moved to stage three. We have one class before the end of semester to be able to come up with some recommendations. And so my guiding uh, principles for recommendations to students are thinking about individual behavior, right? We want to make a difference for individual behavior and individual choices. But we need to recognize that that's in relation to, yes, people make personal choices. But that's within a socio-cultural context related to expectations of various groups. Also, organizational policies and the physical environment in which we operate. We teach the health promotion philosophy that we want to make the right choice the easy choice. And then I also ask students to make up to three recommendations based on our findings. And then what I did is I gave each recommendation a point for a student vote. And then I rank ordered the recommendations in the report to be able to forward those recommendations to our college administration. So these were the categories that students thought were really important for us to act on. 
So number one, they thought that we could do some more effort with respect to education and capacity building. And in particular, connecting students to food outlets with some kind of food map. Um, and then maybe even uh, creating a student cookbook. Right? And so they could think about how to create affordable, nutritious foods um, with some kind of food cookbook. They also thought the food cookbook could be sold, potentially, in order to raise money and raise awareness about the issue for their fellow students, which is kind of related to the second point there. 39 points for advocacy and awareness, creating some kind of you know, food drives and student cookbooks. We recognized, actually, that um, you know, the, call it, the library does what's called food for fines at the end of semester. So you can, instead of paying a, a library fine, you can bring in a donation to the food bank. I think it's brilliant. Um, but you know what? That food goes to the food bank off campus. It doesn't go to our local in-house food bank. And so students were like, oh, wait a second, that should stay here and then get redistributed to students that need it here on campus. And so we're looking at that and seeing if that's something that we could do a little bit better. Uh, the third one is around food assistance programs. And so I don't know if you guys ever had student discounts. Seems like they're fewer and far between these days, right? Where you could have like, um, you know, all you can eat pizza night for students at a particular pizza restaurant, or you might be able to get two for one fajitas, you know, on Tuesdays, right? And so some restaurants used to cater to student populations, um, you know, until the basketball team comes in and has like, yeah, puts them out of business, really. <laughs> Um, and I, of course, that's a challenge for a lot of our local businesses, right? Is that, you know, students are here during the off season, but that might also be a difficult time for some of our local businesses. So, um, but thinking about how we could create more student discounts or maybe a coupon system where students could get some um, additional food for, uh, for more affordable pricing. Um, they also uh, had this wonderful student who had this really imaginative plan about how our tradespeople and how our sustainable construction management people could work together on creating a greenhouse. Like really, she had a really grand plan for this uh, facility construction. A greenhouse facilities as well as a community garden. You know, one of our challenges is that our main academic semester is from September to May, right, or September to April. So you know the main growing season is you know, May through. You know, so for us to maintain a garden as, with a student population is really difficult. And so that's where these community partnerships could really be helpful for the college to be able to create something like that. Is really we need a group of interested community people that are keen on um, doing some of that, uh, that work in the, in the time when the students aren't here. Um, I mentioned already about improving our food preparation spaces. Uh, looking at maybe a gleaning club or maybe a specific event for gleaning. And then uh, this, has already been, this has already happened. Mika was so fast. She goes, yeah, that's easy to do. Let's make it happen. And then this just la those are the categories. These are the specific actions that fall under the specific categories. So we like to um, make it easy for administrators to say yes to some of our suggestions. And so I asked students to go into a little bit more detail about each of the items that they thought we could act on fairly quickly. And so this is just a summary of those ideas. And uh, many of them are underdeveloped as far as the students' ideas are concerned. And so now it's up to me to take many of these ideas and find the local campus service groups or staff or faculty that might be interested in trying to get some of these things going. Um, oftentimes at this campus, it takes a staff or faculty member to take the lead on something like this, maybe incorporate it into a student project um, in order to be able to, to make it happen for students on campus. Because we have a lot of turnover, right? A lot of one, two year programs. So it's hard to get uh, something going over the long term.